Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for another midweek mystery video where this week I'm covering one of the most requested videos I've ever had on this channel. I've purposely put it off for a really long time because it's a very very long case. So make yourself comfortable, get yourself a drink and we'll get into it. It's been a while since I've covered an unsolved serial killer case. I've done the Zodiac Killer, I've done the Phantom Killer of Texarkana, I've done the Doodler, and today I'm doing the Long Island Serial Killer. The Long Island Serial Killer is often known as the Lisk or the Gilgo Beach Killer. For a long time I actually didn't even realise that the Lisk and the Gilgo Beach Killer were the same, but they are. He's believed to have killed between 10 to 16 people, mostly sex workers, over a period of about 20 years. Now our story starts with 24 year old Shannon Gilbert. Now Shannon didn't have the easiest childhood, she was sort of raised in and out of foster care for most of her childhood, but despite this she grew up to be a very strong woman with a really, really good sense of where she wanted to go in life. She was very, very smart. She wanted to work towards giving herself a better future. And although as a child, her relationship with her family was pretty strained, as she grew up, she got a lot closer to her mum and her sisters. She had aspirations to move to New York where she wanted to become a singer and an actor. From what I can gather, she was actually very, very talented. Um, she was very smart as well, like I said, and she ended up graduating high school early. After graduation, she held a number of different jobs. She was waitressing, she was a receptionist, doing temp work, a little bit of everything. And alongside this, she was also doing online university classes at Phoenix University. She was working so, so hard to get out of this life she wanted to go to New York but she just felt like with all of her work that she had she just wasn't getting anywhere she needed money to achieve her dreams and so she decided to start escorting she intended for it to be temporary she wanted to build enough savings that she could get out of the hole she found herself stuck in and she wanted to move to the city move to New York and sex work was easy money for her. She was a good looking girl, she had a lot of clients, and she could earn more in one night's work being a sex worker than she could in a whole week doing her waitressing. She started off working for a prostitution ring. She worked for a ring called Lace Party Girls, but she got arrested and there were some legal troubles around it. And so she decides to go out on her own and she starts actually working for herself through Craigslist. It was easier for her, she could cut out the middleman and she could earn more money for herself. Um, but she didn't want to go out completely alone, she wanted to make sure that she was safe because that was the number one priority for her. And so she starts employing a driver named Michael Pack and she would give him some of the profits for driving her to all these different locations to meet these men and he kind of acted like her security as well. It was the very early hours of May 1st 2010 when Shannon gets contacted by a man on Craigslist, a man called Joseph Brewer. Now Shannon and Michael take the two hour drive from Jersey City where Shannon lived to Oak Beach, Long Island. They arrived there just after 2am. Now Oak Beach was a gated community and Joseph Brewer was actually living there in his mother's house. He'd recently separated from his wife and he had a young daughter and he was just living this new bachelor life which for him included hiring sex workers from time to time. She arrived at his property just after 2am and heads straight inside, Michael waiting outside in the black SUV. Now according to phone records there are actually six very short phone calls made between Shannon and Michael around 2.55 a.m. Um, along with a call to a nearby CVS. Shannon apparently wanted Michael to go and pick up some supplies for her from CVS but Michael refused because he didn't know where the local CVS was to Oak Beach. He wasn't familiar with the area and he didn't really feel comfortable leaving Shannon with a random guy. Like he was supposed to be looking after her. That was his job. And then it seems after that Shannon didn't really push it. Nothing really happened for a couple of hours that we know of anyway until after 4.30 a.m. when Joseph Brewer tries to attract Michael's attention from the house. Joseph says that Shannon's causing him some trouble inside the house and that he wanted her to get out, he wanted her to leave, but she was refusing. And when Michael reaches the house, Shannon's apparently crouched behind one of the sofas on the phone to 911 and she's saying repeatedly on the phone, they're trying to kill me, they're trying to kill me. According to records, this phone call took place at 4.51 a.m. and Shannon stayed on the line with 911 for 23 minutes. While she's on the phone, while Michael is apparently trying to get her out of the house, she just stands up and runs out of the house, running down the road, screaming for help, stopping and knocking on occasional doors. 
Now bear in mind that the version of events I've just told you comes from the mouths of Joseph and Michael. There was nobody else there to witness what had happened, but they both said something along these lines. The transcripts of this particular 911 call have never been released to the public or even to Shannon's family, despite a very long, lengthy legal battle to get these released. A New York judge ruled in November 2018, so literally just a matter of months ago, that these tapes have to be released to Shannon's family and gave the police 20 days to release them, um, but they haven't. The police claim that the recordings were part of an ongoing homicide investigation and therefore they can't be released without compromising the investigation they have going on. However, the judge said that he failed to see how allowing people to have access to these tapes would affect the investigation in any way at this point because it's been nearly 10 years. At the end of the day, if the police did release these tapes to the public, it could trigger somebody's memory, it could cause somebody to come forward, somebody could have an idea about what happened. But as far as I can find, the judge said for them to release the tape back in November 2018, it is now June 2019 and it doesn't look like they've actually released them yet. It makes me wonder what on earth could be on these tapes that makes the police so protective over them. So it's about 5am, Shannon's running frantically down the street screaming that people are going to kill her and one of Joseph Brewer's neighbours is 75 year old Gus Coletti who wakes up very early in the morning. So that morning just before 5am he's awake in his bathroom having a shave. He's hearing some erratic screams and suddenly there's this banging at his front door so he goes to open it and Shannon's standing there looking an absolute mess and she's screaming at him help me, help me. He leads her over to a chair and tells her to sit down whilst he calls 911 himself, even though at this point I'm pretty sure she is still on the phone to 911. He asks her to tell him what's wrong, what's happened, and as soon as he lifts the receiver to call 911, Shannon bolts out the open door and starts running down the street again. He calls 911 regardless just to tell them what's happened. He watches down the road to see where Shannon's going and as he does so he sees this black SUV driving down the road slowly as if it's looking for somebody and of course it's Michael in the SUV and he is looking for Shannon. Now Gus can see Shannon from where he stood in his porch. He can see that Shannon's crouching behind a car, maybe a boat on a driveway but Michael can't see Shannon from the road. Michael shouts over to Gus and asks if he's seen a young woman and Gus replies saying he's called for help. Apparently Michael responds saying you shouldn't have done that. Now Michael apparently at this point is pretty pissed off. He assumes that Shannon's just playing one of her tricks to make sure that he doesn't get his cut for that night. He carries on searching for her for about an hour until about 6am when he gives up and leaves, just thinking that she's playing some kind of game. He says that he never saw the police arrive, he never spoke to the police, even though he was there for almost an hour after Shannon called 911. Shannon continues running down the road, knocking on neighbours' doors, but she's not getting any response because it is very early in the morning. And then she's gone. Now Shannon was reported missing for almost two days, even though she lived with her boyfriend, Alex Diaz. Now he noticed that something was wrong when she didn't return home the next day, but I can only assume that maybe this is something she did occasionally because he doesn't contact Michael Pack until the day after that. Michael gives Alex an overview of what happened that night, says that Shannon ran off in what he can only assume was a drug fueled craze. But Alex knows this doesn't sound quite right. I mean, Shannon did do drugs occasionally, it sort of came with part of her job. As a sex worker, you're sometimes expected to do drugs with your clients. And Shannon did drink, but she'd never had a reaction like that. So Alex, not really knowing what to do, makes steps to contact Shannon's client that night, Joseph Brewer. And Alex actually turns up in Oak Beach with a gun to confront Joseph. And he's shocked when Joseph is just very open and very honest with him. He expected some kind of lashback but he was just very helpful. Joseph even invited Alex inside of his home, sat down with him and sort of like spoke about everything that happened and even offered to go down to the local police station with him to report exactly what had happened. Um, Joseph did deny that him and Shannon had sex that night, that they just apparently had a conversation, um, but that's probably not the case. But of course Joseph wasn't going to just readily admit actually having sex with a sex worker, of course he's just going to say they had a conversation. As you can probably guess, the police did not take this seriously at all. A sex worker who just ran off into the night? she's probably off getting high somewhere. They told Alex to go home and wait for her there, that she was probably already back at home at this point, and that if she hasn't returned home within a couple of days, to contact the Jersey City Police instead. This is another one of those really annoying cases with all of these different jurisdictional issues. Shannon lived in Jersey City, but she went missing 
in Oak Beach. Whose jurisdiction was it? Whose place was it to look for her? Neither of them really cared. Of course, Shannon doesn't return home and Alex returns back to Oak Beach a total of three times in the next week. The second time he returns is on the 4th of May and he runs into a man called Dr. Peter Hackett. The two of them talk about Shannon's case, Alex tells Dr. Peter Hackett exactly what's gone on and Peter apparently has a notebook and he's writing down all of these notes. Peter says that he'll do everything he can to help Alex look for his girlfriend and he'll let him know as soon as he sees anything strange. However, a couple of days before this, just two days after Shannon's disappearance, a weird turn happened in this case. Shannon's mother, Mary Gilbert, receives a very odd phone call from a complete stranger who introduces himself as Dr. Peter Hackett. The man on the other end of the phone asks if Shannon's there and of course she wasn't. Mary asked for more of an explanation as to who this random man calling her was. He explains to her that he apparently runs a house for wayward girls and Shannon had been with him two days earlier on the night she went missing. Peter said that he'd taken her in that night and gave her a sedative to calm her down and then apparently the next morning she left with her driver. Now the fact that Shannon probably went to Peter Hackett's house can be confirmed by another neighbour called Tom who saw Shannon frantically knocking on Peter's front door. Now bear in mind this phone call was made on the 3rd of May and Peter met Alex on the 4th of May and pretended to know nothing about Shannon, nothing about her case, he said he'd never even knew that a girl had gone missing that night. So it's just very, very strange. Mary asked Peter on the phone how on earth that he got her number and he replies saying that each person that stays with him has to fill in an emergency contact form. Um, but Mary knew that Shannon most likely wouldn't give her number in a situation like that. She'd probably give maybe Alex's number instead. To this day, we still don't know how Peter got Mary's number. The most likely scenario is that maybe Michael or Alex gave him Mary's number at some point, but this still seems unlikely. Um, but they may have provided him with enough information about Shannon to track this number down, possibly through her medical records. On May 9th, Mary Gilbert and the rest of Shannon's family actually head up to Oak Beach to put up flyers and search for Shannon. Bar a really short search in the air by the police, not much had been done to look for her by the police at this point, so it was all up to them. In the years following the disappearance, Mary Gilbert has been questioned extensively about this phone call with Dr. Peter Hackett, or at least somebody who was claiming to be him. Peter would claim that the first time he ever had any contact with the Gilbert family was on May 9th when they came up to Oak Beach with the Flyers. But he was one of these people who loved to get involved in other people's business. His nose was always in places that it didn't quite belong. His entire professional history was littered with embellished stories and just outright lies about his life and other people's. He was eventually fired from the police for misusing a work mobile and claiming to be at work when he wasn't. And there's no doubt that he went out of his way to get himself involved in Shannon's story. His involvement in this, or the suspicion around him in this case, is solely on him. He got himself involved in this story. Once an investigation into Shannon's disappearance was eventually kick-started over a month after her disappearance, it was confirmed that Peter did indeed call Mary on the 3rd of May from his wife's mobile phone. It's important to remember that by this point on the 3rd of May, Shannon hadn't officially been reported missing yet and it was the day before he met Alex who apparently is the first one who told him Shannon's story. He pretended to Alex that it was the first time he was hearing any of this. But by this point, he'd somehow already found Mary's number and had been calling her from his wife's work phone and then denying that he'd ever done this. And the weirdest thing of all is that this call wasn't made from Oak Beach. He'd travelled to New Jersey, very, very close to Mary's home, to make this call and he wasn't forthcoming with any of this information. Actually, as far as I'm aware, he still denies making that phone call. Like I mentioned, it took the police over a month to start properly investigating Shannon's disappearance. And by properly, I wouldn't even call it a proper police investigation. It was pretty obvious that they didn't really care that much. They questioned some people in the neighbourhood. They questioned Joseph Brewer, Gus Coletti and Peter Hackett, as well as Michael Pack and Alex Diaz. They looked around the neighbourhood a little bit. They found nothing. Um, and Michael Pack told them that Shannon had likely just run away because that was the kind of person she was. Apparently Michael Pack and Joseph Brewer and maybe Dr. P. Tackett, I'm not 100% sure on that, have all passed polygraph tests. To them, Shannon was a missing sex worker. That was it, they didn't really care. 
Alex had been very upfront and honest with the police, telling them that Shannon did occasionally do drugs, sometimes cocaine, sometimes weed, sometimes prescription medication. She drank occasionally and she also suffered with bipolar disorder and she wasn't taking her medication for it. The lack of communication between the Jersey City and the Oak Beach, which I think was Suffolk County Police Department, meant they didn't make the connection between Shannon's disappearance and this frantic 911 call from a very distressed young lady for quite a few weeks. Michael Pack, Joseph Brewer and Peter Hackett were all cleared of any suspicion very, very early on in the investigation. Exactly why they were cleared is anybody's guess. Because it took police so long to look into this case, people's memories were very hazy and people's CCTV, because a lot of people on the street had CCTV cameras which would have shown the entire events that night, they'd all been written over in that time because it had been weeks. It's very clear that they made no effort whatsoever because if they had, they would have found Shannon very easily. Officer John Malia had worked in the Suffolk County Police Department for 31 years. He was a private investigator turned a very, very seasoned police officer. And he was also a canine officer. He had a German Shepherd named Blue, who around the time of Shannon's disappearance required some on the job training. So John Malia and Blue are given the job of searching around Oak Beach for Shannon's body, if there was a body to be found. To be fair, the police weren't doing this to actually look for the body, they just knew that Blue needed a bit of training and this was a perfect opportunity. They never actually expected to find anything, but they did find something and it was a hell of a lot more than they'd ever bargained for. John and Blue searched the Oak Beach area for months, never finding any trace of anything suspicious. Eventually, the police department decided that they wanted John to stop the training exercise. He'd done his job, they hadn't found anything, and Blue had been trained. But something told John not to give up on the case. So whenever he had a bit of spare time off the clock, him and Blue would return to the Oak Beach area and the miles surrounding it just to have a sniff around. This continued until December 10th, 2010. Shannon had been missing for over six months at this point. It was pretty much a complete cold case. John had recently read something from the FBI which said that murder victims are often dumped within 30 feet of the road. So there's this big road that leads to Oak Beach called the Ocean Parkway. On a whim one day, John decides to pull over at the side of the road and let Blue sniff around just to see if this theory is correct. Next to Ocean Parkway is Gilgo Beach. Now when you think of a beach you think of gorgeous white sands and a blue sea and this isn't exactly what Gilgo Beach is like. There's sand, there's seashore, but there's also a lot of thick grass, marshland and just a barren looking woodland. It's brambles which are so thick they rip and tear at your clothes and skin, there's lots and lots of poison ivy, so many insects and ticks. It's not the kind of area that anybody would just find themselves walking through because you couldn't really. It's about three in the afternoon when Blue starts to show signs that he's found something and so John starts to walk through the brambles and he follows Blue into the marsh where he finds a disintegrated burlap sack about 50 foot away from the road. He carefully pulls the sack back and finds inside was unmistakably a human skeleton. He immediately contacts people back at the police department and a full investigation and a sweep of the area starts pretty much straight away. The investigation goes on for a few days and two days later, John arrives back at the scene just to help in any way he can. This time he leaves Blue in the car and he decides to search on foot by himself. Again, not really expecting to find anything, but he does find something about 500 foot away from the original burlap sack he finds another, with another human skeleton inside. Immediately, the investigation steps up a notch. They found two bodies now, so are there any more? There were. By the end of the day, they had uncovered two more burlap sacks containing bodies. These four bodies were going to be known as the Gilgo Beach Four. Suffolk County Police Commissioner Richard Dormer said four bodies found in the same location pretty much speaks for itself. It's more than a coincidence. We could have a serial killer. But at least it means they finally found Shannon Gilbert, right? The police head to Joseph Brewer's house almost immediately and they take him in, they seize his car, they search his house and they question him intensely. They also take in Michael Pack, questioning him for the best part of a day. Both of them pass polygraph tests and they're let go. 
All four bodies appear to be female, all smaller in stature, just like Shannon, but the testing came back showing that none of them were Shannon Gilbert. But their stories were very similar to Shannon's. All four of them were sex workers with very similar lives. The first body discovered was that of Melissa Bartholomew. She was born in 1985 in Buffalo, New York. Melissa was mostly raised by her grandparents as her mother had to work full time to support her growing up. As she got older, she started to push the boundaries of her relationship with her mum, resenting that she wasn't really around when she was growing up, potentially trying to prove some kind of point. And Melissa begins to date a very well-known drug dealer in the area. So her mum carts her off to live in Texas with her father. When she's 18, she steals her father's car in Texas and so her father sends her back to New York. But her family have moved out of the city into the quieter areas of Buffalo and Melissa wants to be in the city where all friends are, where all the action is. And so she decides to go for it on her own. She has to fund her own life though, obviously, as now she can no longer rely on her family. And so she begins to work as a waitress. She then begins to work at Supercuts, a step on her way to her dream of becoming a hairstylist. And she gets involved again with her drug dealer ex, Jordan, who introduced her to a man called Johnny Terry. Johnny offers her a job at a hair salon in New York City. And so Melissa moves to New York, only it turns out that Johnny was a pimp and Melissa begins working for him as a sex worker. Johnny's known on the street to his pimp name as Blaze. And Melissa soon realizes that Blaze is taking a lot of her money and so she decides to go for it on her own and she starts advertising on Craigslist to cut out the middleman. Only Blaze discovers this and gets Melissa attacked on the streets one night. She lives in a tiny studio basement flat. She's an alcoholic, an occasional drug user. She has nowhere to go, especially now that she's cut herself off from Johnny. And so she tells her family that she's going to move back to Buffalo. On July 11th, 2009, Melissa is seen for the last time outside her apartment, seemingly waiting for a lift from someone. Um, and her family actually noticed that Melissa's disappeared very, very quickly. Even though they, they live back in Buffalo, Melissa lives in New York City, she was very, very close with her younger sister, Amanda. And she suddenly stops texting Amanda, and that's weird. Melissa's family try to report her missing, but the police say that she's a sex worker. Her case isn't important. It's almost two weeks until they actually finally listen to her family, and they get kicked into action by some very strange phone calls. Amanda's in her early teen years. She's nine years younger than Melissa, about 13 or 14 years old. And the two were incredibly, incredibly close. Her phone rings four days after she's last heard from Melissa. She sees Melissa's name come up on the caller ID and she's so relieved. Only when she answers, it's not Melissa on the other end. It's a male voice who asks Amanda if she's Melissa's little sister. Amanda replies, yes. Do you know what your sister's doing, he says? she's a whore. Amanda would go on to receive many similar calls over the coming months. The man would speak quietly in a very low voice. He knew where she lived, he knew intimate details about her life, about Melissa's life. He knew that Amanda was mixed race, referring to her as a half-breed. Whoever this person was clearly knew Melissa intimately, or else had some other means of getting this kind of information from her. He told Amanda one night on the last ever call that she would receive, I'm watching your sister's body rot. Amanda was the only person he would speak to. On the evening that her mother, Lynn, answered the call instead of her, he immediately hung up. Police eventually pull Melissa's phone records and find that on the night she disappeared, her phone dialed her voicemail from the town of Massapequa, which isn't far from Gilgo Beach. Now, the obvious suspect here for the police was Blaze, Johnny Terry, Melissa's pimp, and occasional boyfriend, but apparently he had a rock solid alibi for that night in question. There was no way that he could have harmed Melissa in any way. And he also claimed to have received these calls, the same kind of calls that Amanda received. And the police were able to confirm that indeed he did from a disposable phone registered under the name of Mickey Mouse. John said that the man once again knew very intimate details about him. The man on the other end sounded older and he sounded white, but he also sounded like he was very, very drunk. And Amanda confirmed all these details. 
The police had to use Amanda as bait for these calls to try and track the guy that had killed her sister. They gave her instructions to keep the man on the line for as long as she possibly could, so they were able to more accurately trace the calls. She was terrified. The man would tell her troubling things that taunt her about her sister's death. And Amanda was the only person in the family who actually had any idea what Melissa did for a living. I mean, Amanda was young, but she would go to visit Melissa in New York quite often, and she began to piece things together. Even Lynn, their mother, had no idea, but after Amanda started to receive these calls, she had to say something. The police were able to eventually trace the calls made to Amanda, and found they were all made from very busy areas of New York such as Times Square. The person was smart, they knew that the calls would probably be traced back eventually and they knew how to work around this by calling from a really really busy area such as Times Square where literally thousands and thousands of people pass through every hour it's going to be borderline impossible to track it down just to one person. Maureen Brainard Barnes was the first of the girls to disappear. She disappeared back in 2007. She was born in 1982, the oldest child in her family, and she was an academic child. She was actually very, very smart. Up until she became a teenager and discovered boys. She began a relationship with a man called Jason Brainard Barnes when she was just 16 years old and she fell pregnant, leaving school shortly after to give birth to her daughter, Caitlin. And soon after this, they got married. Two years later, the two of them mutually decide to divorce and Jason takes custody of Caitlin because he lives in a good area and has access to good schools. It was just the better choice for both of them. So Maureen moves in with her sister and begins to look for work. Only Maureen never finished high school. She had to leave school to give birth to her daughter. Even though she was incredibly smart, nobody wanted to hire her. She eventually began to do some nude modelling, realising that she could make easy money this way. Only she'd post her photos and people would ask for her services as an escort. She didn't think it was a particularly bad idea, so she starts to advertise herself as an escort on Craigslist. But she only advertised for local men. Eventually, she started to worry about these local men recognising her on the streets when she was with her daughter. So she stops for a while, and in this time, she starts dating someone and actually ends up having a son called Aiden. Now her and Aiden's father don't last long and now Maureen has two children to provide for financially. She starts working at a call centre but she's trying to juggle the custody of two children and she just can't make it work and so she decides she's got no choice but to go to Manhattan and become a full-time sex worker. Her ex-boyfriend was attempting to claim full custody of Aiden and Maureen had actually recently been evicted and there was this court case pending over the custody battle. But on the day she's due to be in court, Maureen doesn't turn up. Her sister Missy attempts to locate her but it just seems like she's disappeared off the face of the planet. So she eventually reports her as missing to the police. Maureen's family had no idea what she was really doing for a living. They had no clue at all. Until Missy has to hack into Maureen's emails and figures out that she's actually a sex worker. But sadly, the emails gave no clue as to where Maureen actually was on the night she disappeared. And the police found little of interest in their very short investigation into the case. The only clue they had in Maureen's case was that her phone had been turned on somewhere close to Fire Island a few weeks after she went missing. They had no idea where she was until the day her body was discovered at Gilgo Beach. Megan Waterman was the next to go missing. She was born in January 1988 and she had a very troubled upbringing. Her mother Lorraine was an alcoholic and Megan and her brother Greg were left neglected. Her grandmother Muriel actually made repeated calls to social services to get Megan and Greg out of that situation and she actually ends up eventually filing for custody of her grandchildren. Eventually, child services do take Megan and Greg away, but they don't give them to their grandmother. They place them in foster care with Muriel allowed to visit occasionally. Um, eventually, Muriel keeps fighting and she is awarded custody of the children. But it was a little bit too late for Megan, who was struggling with her childhood. She would constantly get in trouble at school. She was even kicked out of elementary school. And throughout of her teenage years, she was arrested multiple times. And she knew many of the local police officers by name. She calmed down for a little bit, determined to give her daughter the best life she possibly could. But she struggles and eventually she falls in with the wrong people while she's trying to earn money for her daughter. She meets a man known as Vibe. He's a criminal, a drug dealer, a pimp, and he becomes Megan's pimp. 
Megan and Vibe become desperate for money when Vibe is arrested and they have to post a $50,000 bail and he has all of his belongings seized by the police. They have to make money. So in June 2010, Megan decides to go out and work in Long Island where she can make in excess of $1,500 every single night. She's last seen on the evening of June 5th when her and Vibe leave the motel room. She then returns about half an hour later alone and she makes a few calls in the room that night. Some to Muriel, to Lorraine and her last call was at 1.20am to Vibe. 10 minutes after this she's seen walking out of the motel, never to return again. She'd posted an ad on Craigslist about an hour beforehand so it can be assumed that she was going to meet a client. Vibe was the first to realise that Megan was missing, but he didn't do anything about it because he knew that if he went to the police, they wouldn't take him seriously. He was a criminal, she was a sex worker, what were they going to care? And he also knew that he would likely be the number one suspect in this case, which is eventually what happened. He did become the number one suspect in Megan's disappearance. But he eventually gets arrested for different incidents and he's left in jail, unable to help with the police investigation. And then the final girl of the Gilgo Beach Four is Amber Overstreet. Now Amber had a very happy suburban childhood until she sexually assaulted at the age of five years old by a neighbour and everything changes from that point onward. The man, despite all the evidence, is never arrested and her family just begin to fall apart. Her mum has a nervous breakdown and her dad turns to alcohol. Um, Amber becomes introduced to sex work as a teenager by her older sister Kim who used it to support herself through college and as Amber gets older she starts working alongside her sister as a sex worker and they both begin struggling with drug abuse. Eventually the two decide they've had enough with their life of sex work and drugs and so they decide to make a break for it and take a fresh start down in Florida. Amber gets involved in a local church down there, she turns to her faith to help her heal and she meets the man who would go on to become her husband. A year later they adopt a baby boy but her marriage slowly begins to break down and Amber is arrested when she attempts to steal toothpaste from a local store. She runs out of Florida and goes to live with Kim who is now in North Carolina. Amber falls back into drugs, she goes to rehab and eventually both Kim and Amber end up back in sex work, posting their ads on Craigslist. It's difficult to get straight in life when you know that by posting one ad on Craigslist you could earn thousands of dollars every single night. Amber ends back up on heroin and eventually moves to New York, still advertising on Craigslist. Eventually Amber goes missing and nobody ever reports it. That night she left her phone and her handbag at home. Clearly whoever she went with, she trusted. Nobody would have any clue where Amber was until the day that she is discovered at Gilgo Beach. Each of these girls are so similar with their difficult childhoods, they struggled in life, they're all around the same age, all fairly petite sex workers who advertise their services on Craigslist. Um, tests came back proving that all four girls had likely died from strangulation, but it's difficult to know that for sure when all that's left is a skeleton. It was obvious that there was a serial killer on the loose, but the public didn't really seem to care. I mean, it was all over the media, it was the biggest news in Long Island in a very long time, but the public weren't exactly scared. The general consensus was that these girls were sex workers, they put themselves at risk, they were advertising on Craigslist and they were getting into cars with strange men of course this was going to happen to them. They only had themselves to blame. This killer clearly wasn't just going to grab a random woman off the street, they had an MO and it was sex workers. So everyone in Long Island just continued going about their daily lives. But this was a media sensation and the journalists were over this like leeches. And sadly the Gilgo Beach Four wouldn't be the only bodies found along the shore. Jessica Taylor was another victim. She had a tale very similar to the rest. She had a difficult upbringing resulting in her turning to sex work to survive. She spends a short amount of time in prison, she dabbles in drugs. Her story just happened to be a number of years earlier than the rest. Jessica was last seen alive in July 2004, just off of Manhattan's 10th Avenue. But it didn't take them years to find Jessica. Only a couple of weeks after she disappeared, they kind of had their answer. A woman at the end of July was walking her dog in Manorville, which is just off the Long Island Expressway, when she discovers a torso. No head, no limbs, just a torso, which obviously made it pretty hard for her to be identified. But a police officer who just happened to know Jessica personally was looking through the case file of this mutilated torso that had been found when he spots a tattoo that he knew pretty well. It was a tattoo of wings with words, Remy's Angel. 
Whoever had hurt Jessica had tried their best to mutilate and destroy this tattoo, but it clearly hadn't worked because the police officer recognised it immediately. But if Jessica's torso was found in Manorville, what does she have to do with the Lisk? Well, the rest of her bodies, her limbs, her head, were found on Gilgo Beach on May 9th, 2011. This suggests that the Lisk has possibly been in operation for many, many years before anybody had any clue he even existed. And who's to say that he's only been active in Long Island? He could have been active in many areas around the country, killing sex workers and leaving their bodies in desolate areas, and they've just never been found. By late March and early April 2011, four more bodies were discovered in separate areas off the parkway, within two miles of the original Gilgo Beach 4. They included two women, a man and a toddler. John Doe was discovered on April 4th, 2011. He appeared to be a young Asian male who died from blunt force trauma. And to this day, he's still unidentified despite police efforts and many, many composite sketches. The police stated that he was likely a sex worker at the time of his death. And it seemed that he was found in women's clothing. He was between 17 and 23 when he went missing, about five foot six. He had four teeth missing and he, had, and he had some kind of musculoskeletal disorder which may have affected his gait. In other words, he may have had a very distinctive walk. He had been dead for five to 10 years by the time of his discovery. The police speculate that he may have lived as a woman, but of course this is just conjecture based on the fact that he was discovered in female clothing. They believe that he may have been murdered after his client found out that he wasn't female. I did struggle a lot with what pronouns to use when talking about John Doe, but to keep things straightforward for the viewer, I decided just to refer to him as male because it's just speculation that he may have been transgender. The head, right foot and hands of Jane Doe number six were found on April 4th, 2000 in a heavily wooded area of Manorville, the same place where Jessica Taylor's torso was found. Other parts of Jane Doe number six's remains were found on April 4th, 2011, along Ocean Parkway. The DA said in a news conference that the manner of disposal of that woman was very similar to that of Jessica Taylor, but distinctly dissimilar to that of the Gilgo Beach Four. In September 2011, the police released a composite sketch of Jane Doe number six. She was about five foot two, between 18 and 35, and very likely a sex worker. Baby Doe was found on April 4th, 2011, about 250 foot away from the remains of Jane Doe number six. She was likely a female toddler between 16 and 24 months old, fully skeletonized, wrapped in a blanket and showing no signs of trauma. She was likely a person of color and was wearing gold earrings and a gold necklace when she was found. She had likely been there since the mid 90s. DNA testing showed that Baby Doe was actually the daughter of Jane Doe number three, who was found 10 miles east near Jones Beach State Park, or partially found, I should say. On June 28th, 1997, the dismembered torso of a young African-American female was found at Hampstead Lake State Park in Lakeview, New York. The torso was found in a green plastic container dumped on the side of the road next to the lake. And investigators were never able to identify this Jane Doe. And she became commonly known as Peaches due to a tattoo of a heart-shaped peach on her left breast. And then on April 11th, 2011, the police found dismembered remains inside a plastic bag near Jones Beach State Park, who they named Jane Doe number three, and obviously soon confirmed it was the mother of Baby Doe. It took until December 2016 for them to realise that Jane Doe number three was actually Peaches, they were the same person. Jane Doe number seven was also discovered that same day on April 11th, 2011, at Tobey Beach, where a human skull and several teeth were recovered. Testing confirmed that these were linked to a set of severed legs found in a bin bag on Fire Island in April 1996. This Jane Doe had a surgical scar on her left leg. So we have 10 victims in total here. The Gilgo Beach Four, all sex workers who disappeared in the months of June to September in 2007, 2009 and 2010 respectively under very similar circumstances. Then we have Jessica Taylor, dismembered and placed in two different locations, along with Jane Doe 6 and 7. Baby Doe, John Doe, and still no sign of Shannon Gilbert. You're probably wondering at this point, or have wondered several times, why can the police simply track the killer through the emails. Surely the killer was contacting them through Craigslist email system. Well, Craigslist is notorious for its anonymity. It uses an anonymous system which hides emails and ensures that people can't be tracked. It's the allure of Craigslist. 
and it's why it's so popular for sex workers. As the months went by, the search on Gilgo Beach began to wind down. It became clear that they weren't going to find any more bodies there. But Mary Gilbert, Shannon's mum, wasn't about to give up on finding her daughter. Her biggest target was Dr. Peter Hackett. She was sure that he had something to do with her daughter's disappearance, or at least knew something about it that he wasn't telling. So she turns to the media and she starts to tell her story, fighting for the marsh behind Dr. Hackett's house to be fully searched by the police. Eventually, in the first week of December 2011, the police agree and they dredge the marsh to search it for Shannon. And on December 6th, they find something. They find Shannon's handbag, mobile, and jeans in the marsh. So they keep searching, and on December 13th, they find her body, immediately identifiable due to the titanium plate she had in her jaw. She was found in the marsh behind Dr. Peter Hackett's house. The best view of the area in which she was found is directly from his back porch. There was an autopsy done by the Suffolk County Medical Examiner who announced in May 2012 that Shannon's death was accidental. She died of misadventure, apparently. The thought was that she had drowned in the marshy water after running through the street. She starts to run through the marsh, she trips and drowns. She was in a bad mental state, a mixture of her bipolar disorder and the fact that she was on drugs, despite all the tests for cocaine on her body coming back as negative. If she was high on drugs, then there is a chance that she could have slipped and fell in the marsh, unable to get back up, drowning in the water. But the water levels that day would have been incredibly, incredibly low, less than a foot deep. It is possible to drown in just a few inches of water, I know, but it just seems unlikely. But she wasn't buried or hidden, she was just lying there in the marsh. Her jeans were removed and there were actually two small bones missing from her throat, the hyoid bones. When these particular bones are missing, the medical examiner would usually deduce that somebody had been strangled. But still, it's ruled as accidental and Shannon isn't linked to being a victim of the LISC. It was an accidental death according to them, a tragedy. But it was honestly shocking to me that it took the police so long to find her body. It was there the whole time and it wasn't particularly difficult for them to find. If the police had done a proper search on the day she went missing, they likely would have found her then. And the existence of the Long Island serial killer may never have even been discovered. A second independent autopsy took place at the very beginning of 2016, but the new medical examiner concluded that there is no evidence that she did die of a natural cause of a drug overdose or of drowning. There is insufficient evidence to determine a definite cause of death, but the autopsy findings are consistent with homicidal strangulation. Nearly all of Shannon's remains appeared normal, apart from the fact that the larynx bone and the hyoid bones were missing. These structures, the larynx and the hyoid bone, are often fractured during homicidal strangulation. Despite all of this, and the fact that Shannon was basically found in Peter Hackett's back garden, the police have always been insistent that he is not a suspect in this case. Neither is Joseph Brewer, neither is Michael Pack. But I think one, or potentially all of them, knows more than they're letting on. Regardless of whether Peter is guilty or not, I have little sympathy for him because he inserted himself into Shannon's story. He easily could have done nothing, and I doubt that he would have ever really been looked at twice. But the fact that he went out of his way to call Mary Gilbert and then go on to deny it, he claimed he ran a house for wayward girls, he told people that he gave Shannon a sedative, and then he claimed that he'd never met her. He would go on to deny it all, but he told people these things. He inserted himself into that story, and he made himself look suspicious. He may not have murdered her, but he put himself into the story, which makes him a suspect, whether he likes it or not. The key to finding out what actually happened to Shannon that night is what scared her at Joseph Brewer's house. Something happened in that house which terrified her enough that she was scared for her life. There may be answers in the 911 call if the police ever actually release it. Personally, I don't think there's anything particularly telling in the call. I just think the police know that they fucked up and they were just transferring Shannon from one jurisdiction to another. She didn't actually know where she was, so she was telling the police on the phone that she was in Jones Beach, but she wasn't. She was in Oak Beach. So she was just being transferred around, most likely. So the police probably haven't released it because they know that they actually weren't any help on the phone call. It makes them look bad. Or on the flip side, there could actually be something very telling on there. Personally, I don't think Shannon was a victim of the Long Island serial killer, but nor do I think her death was an accident. I think somebody on the street harmed her that night. 
Her jeans being removed is the biggest tell here. She wouldn't have taken off her jeans before running into the marsh. I just think her death coincidentally led to a bigger discovery here. Mary Gilbert actually died in 2016, aged just 52. She was an advocate for her daughter right up until the day she died, when she was actually murdered by her other daughter, Sarah. Now, Sarah suffered from schizophrenia and it's believed that the voices in her head told her to do it. And that's a direct quote, that's what she said. Um, she pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity in court, but she was eventually charged with second degree murder and fourth degree possession of a weapon. So there's no one really fighting for Shannon anymore, at least not as much as Mary was. Just quickly though, I just wanna focus on something small here. Um, schizophrenia is actually a genetic condition. It's very commonly found in families. So there's a lot of theories that Shannon may have suffered with schizophrenia herself, which would have led to her strange actions on the night that she disappeared. Of course, she was never diagnosed, so it is just purely speculation. I suppose it could explain away a number of things that happened that night, but not really her death. But let's just focus back on the list and talk about some potential theories. One of the biggest theories you actually see floating around on the internet about this case is that not all of the bodies on Gilgo Beach were the work of just one person. There's a lot of speculation that this was actually the work of two separate serial killers. Authorities mostly disagree with that, saying that the chances of that are so slim it's almost impossible. Serial killers are rare and it's even rarer for two to just happen to use the same part of a beach as a dumping ground. But Gilgo Beach was the perfect area to leave a body. The thick brambles, the poison ivy, nobody would ever see anything. But there's no denying you've got two pretty different, pretty distinct MOs here. The Suffolk County District Attorney was actually one of the first people to present the idea of two separate killers. The Gilgo Beach Four and potentially Shannon were all likely strangled before being placed in burlap sacks and hidden along Gilgo Beach. The rest of the bodies don't quite match up to this MO. Jessica Taylor, Jane Doe number six, Peaches and Jane Doe number seven were all dismembered and their bodies were scattered between Gilgo Beach and other areas in the state. Baby Doe was obviously related to Jane Doe number three, probably just an unavoidable consequence of her death. Separating the mother and baby would have been entirely intentional acts, I'm sure, because they were actually buried on opposite sides of the county line. One was buried in Nassau County and one was in Suffolk County, which is just a jurisdictional issue that would have made like matching them together a lot more complicated. It seems like the killer would have done this on purpose to confuse the authorities. John Doe seems to be the only anomaly here. He died from blunt force trauma and he wasn't dismembered in any way. It seems like his death wasn't as cold and calculated as the rest, but probably just the result of pure anger, which leads on to the theory that he was a sex worker dressed as a female and the client got so mad when they discovered that he wasn't female that they murdered him. But whether it was just one or two killers, they targeted sex workers only, which isn't hugely surprising as they are often the targets of serial killers. Just generalizing here, but they tend to be secretive. They use burner phones or anonymous internet services such as Craigslist to do their job. And think about the kind of men who would usually use sex workers. Again, this is a huge generalization, don't jump down my throat. But the kind of men who use sex workers are usually the kind of men who can't get their own women, they can't get into relationships, they can't get sex themselves, and this would incite a rage in them and a lot of anger, and they'd possibly end up wanting to be violent towards these women. Nearly 78% of female victims of serial killers are sex workers, 78%. But there is of course a theory that this is just one serial killer who's refined their technique, refined their MO over time. The dismembered bodies were all years old, from as early as the mid 90s. The intact bodies, the asphyxiated Gilgo Beach Four, were fairly recent. It could well have been the same person who back in the 90s had to dismember the bodies to ensure that they couldn't be identified and therefore neither could he. But with the anonymous service of Craigslist, it was no longer a worry that he could potentially be traced. He didn't need to dismember the bodies and hide them, he could just leave them in the sack at the side of the road and there was no way of it ever getting traced back. To him. There has only ever actually been one confirmed suspect for the Long Island serial killer, or at least 
one of the Lisk murders. And that is John Bitrolf, as confirmed by the Suffolk County Prosecutor on September 12th, 2017. Bitrolf was first arrested in 2014 after he was linked by DNA to the death of two sex workers, Rita Tangredi and Colleen McNane. Their bodies were found in 1993 and 94, and the police made the match all of those years later, 20 years later, thanks to DNA submitted by Bitrolf's brother in a completely unrelated case. Bitrolf was convicted of murder in 2017 and he was sentenced to 25 years for each murder. Now he had lived in Manorville, just three miles from where the torsos of Jessica Taylor and Jane Doe number six were found and the limbs of these were obviously later found at Gilgo Beach. The link the prosecutor made here is pretty obvious. John Bitrolf murdered sex workers, the Gilgo Beach four, and likely the rest of the victims were also sex workers. But there's a bit more of a connection here. So it's been reported that the daughter of Rita Tangredi, one of John Bitroll's victims, was actually best friends with Melissa Bartholomew, one of the Gilgo Beach Four. And Melissa apparently had a huge number of unexplained calls from her phone to Manorville in the weeks leading up to her death. It's long been suspected that the Gilgo Beach Four knew their killer, knew them well, and trusted them. They all felt comfortable with whoever they went with that night. But Bitrolf was connected to the murders in the early 90s by DNA. Not a single one of the other bodies has DNA on it, or at least not that I've seen any reports of. Another connection people often make is to former Suffolk County Police Chief James Burke. And this is a suggestion made by John Ray, who was actually the attorney for the Gilbert family. John Ray held a press conference and he brought forward a Long Island sex worker called Leanne. Leanne said that she'd attended a party in Oak Beach the year before Shannon went missing. And at this party, everyone was drinking and everyone was doing cocaine. At this party, she meets James Burke and she claims that James got a little bit too handsy and roughed her up choking her and forcing her to do things that she didn't want to do. He called her not a good whore. And this would have been a few months before he eventually made police chief. She said that the whole interaction was so violent that it really stuck in her mind. James Burke later ended up serving a 46 month prison sentence after beating a man in custody who apparently stole a duffel bag filled with sex toys and porn out of his car and then he tried to cover up all of his actions but obviously got caught out. James also denied help from the FBI in the Long Island serial killer case which is something that made many many people suspicious. If you're a small police department like Suffolk County was and the FBI are offering their help in a brand new serial killer case that you've suddenly got on your hands you would usually say yes to that pretty quickly but James Burke refused. Why would you refuse unless you're potentially trying to cover something up? He justified his actions by saying that he didn't want the FBI profile made because it meant then if they did catch the potential killer then the defense could easily destroy the entire case if the person didn't match up to the profile which just sounds like a bit of a poor excuse. But to be honest there's really not much to link James Burke to being the Lisk apart from the fact that he roughed up a sex worker and clearly just wasn't a very good person all around but that doesn't make somebody a serial killer there's no evidence here to prove that he had anything to do with the list you can't write him off of course but you can't really write off anyone in this case because there's literally no evidence and the final suspect i'm going to talk about here quickly is one i've already mentioned quite a lot is dr peter hackett I don't feel like I could talk about suspects without mentioning his name. A lot of people suspect him due to how involved he is in the story. A lot of serial killers like to stay close to the story in order just to keep an eye on what's going on. They think it makes them look helpful rather than suspicious. But personally, I don't think Peter Hackett matches the profile of this killer. Perhaps he did kill Shannon Gilbert, but I don't see him being the kind of person who'd be able to kill 10 plus people with relative ease. He had a prosthetic leg, he walked with a limp, and he had breathing difficulties. Whoever did this would have to pull over at the side of the Ocean Parkway and drag these bodies out of their car into this bushland, and I don't think Pete Hackett, with his limp, would have been able to do that very easily. His limp also makes him more noticeable. It's something distinguishable about him, meaning that if anybody saw him, they would have immediately been able to sort of pin it down to somebody with a limp, somebody potentially with a prosthetic leg or with leg problems. The police have never really given any reason why, but they have stated emphatically that he is not a suspect in Shannon's case, 
nor is he a suspect for the list. I could only assume that he has some very solid alibis or some very high up friends who can do this for him. If he was the killer as well, if he was the Lisk, it was very uncharacteristic of him to call Mary so soon after and introduce himself by name. We know the Lisk obviously called John Terry, they called Amanda, but they never once said their name. And so maybe Peter Hackett was just taking a risk, but it just seems a little bit uncharacteristic. Another name that gets thrown around quite a lot in this case is Neil Falls. Now in July 2015, Neil Falls is shot and killed by a sex worker called Heather Sewell in Charleston, West Virginia. He'd walked to her apartment, he'd held her at gunpoint and attempted to strangle her, but she fought back and managed to get the gun out of his hand and shot him instead. The police attended the scene and they found four sets of handcuffs on his person and they also searched his car and found a machete axes, knives, a shovel, a sledgehammer, bleach, plastic bin bags, a bulletproof vest, clean socks and underwear. He's obviously a suspected serial killer and a sort that he would have killed Heather on the night in question if she hadn't fought back. But they've never been able to definitively link him to any deaths at all. He lived in a number of different states throughout his life and there are lots of reports of murdered sex workers in each state at the time he lived there, but there's reported deaths of sex workers in every state at all times. None of this can really be confirmed, all you can confirm is that he definitely had all the makings of a serial killer and he most likely intended to kill Heather that night. But even if he was the serial killer, there's nothing to link him to being the Lisk, just that he was in the same general area. Let's look at a profile of this killer though. This is an organised killer, somebody who plans and executes his murders with great care, making him almost impossible to apprehend. He's careful, he's meticulous, he knows how to cover his tracks and he knows how to ensure that he's not found. He probably uses or used a VPN and he only used anonymous internet services to find his victims. It's unlikely that he would currently live on or near Ocean Parkway, but he is likely very familiar with the area. He may have perhaps lived there at one point. It's likely that he lives an hour or so away. Not too far to travel to dispose of the bodies, but not too close. He may have lived in Manhattan, seeing as many of the girls were Manhattan based, or at least spent a lot of time there. All of the calls he made to Amanda were from Manhattan. It's also possible that he's a transient or just like an annual visitor to the area. All of the Gilgo Beach Four disappeared in the summer months, so was he travelling to this area to be by the beach for the summer. Maybe he has or had a summer house around the area. Ocean Beach Parkway isn't the kind of area that you just stumble upon one day. You have to kind of know the area to have a reason to go there. He is, was likely a male in their late 30s or 40s. Um, Amanda agrees with this based on the voice in the phone calls. She's sure it was a white voice. Um, he's probably married, potentially with a family, well-educated, technologically adept, and very well-spoken. He'll be financially secure with a reliable job and he will probably, or has to kind of have his own truck or car. He is able to easily blend into normal life and is able to go a long time between his murders. He's likely very charming, the girls feel happy and at ease meeting up with him because it's likely that the girls met up with him multiple different times. I've seen comparisons to the list being somewhere between Ted Bundy and Dennis Rader. The areas in which the bodies were placed were laden with poison ivy, so it's very likely that the killer sought help at a hospital or at least a pharmacist for poison ivy poisoning once or even twice, maybe even more. He likely would also have access to a lot of burlap sacks due to his profession, maybe as a gardener or a landscaper. It's likely that after the bodies were discovered, the Lisk moved on. He can no longer risk operating in an area where all eyes are on this one person. Personally, I think the Lisk is probably still operating just elsewhere in the country, somewhere else where the bodies are yet to be found. I can't see a serial killer like this ever being able to stop unless they're probably arrested for something else, which is unlikely considering how careful and meticulous this killer is. Or they might be dead, which again is unlikely based on the fact that at the time of the killings he was in his 30s or 40s, at most now he's gonna be in his maybe 60s. I really, really hope this case is solved one day because I want to see the kind of person that could be behind this. But that is the story of the Long Island serial killer, the Gilgo Beach killer, the Lisk. It's been a really long time since I last covered an unidentified serial killer case, so I hope that I did this one justice. And make sure that you give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel if you want to see more. And thank you so much for watching. Bye guys.